If you want to go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 4, that's where we're going to be today. I want to start by first saying thank you to Justin for preaching the last two weeks. So thankful for him and, and God using him to share from God's Word. Our family last Sunday was about an hour north of Chicago. We got to see our son after several months as he graduated from boot camp. So now he is off to advanced training for the next uh, year or so. So we're continuing to pray for him, but it was so great being able to see him. But I'm excited to be back as we're going to take four weeks to study the topic of discipleship. Now, typically, our our rhythm here is to study books of the Bible, and in the Sunday following Labor Day, we're going to be taking 12 weeks to, to study the greatest sermon ever preached, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount that you can find in Matthews chapter 5, 6, and 7. But we wanted to take this time leading up to that to really talk about discipleship because of its incredible importance. When we think about discipleship, we realize this isn't just a topic for the church, but it was God's command for the church, right? Like, we're going to see this like, today when Jesus says, follow me, come, follow me, watch what I do, do what I do, and then as Jesus ascends into heaven, he's going to say, okay, all authority has been given to me, now the command is make disciples. And then the three things that he says, make disciples as you're going, Make disciples by baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and make disciples by teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. A discipleship is not just a program of the church, but I believe it, it is meant to be the culture, the purpose of the church. And, and this is something that you hear us say here, it's written on everything, becoming disciples who make disciples. Right? And it's one thing to have that on a web page. It's another thing to have it on Connect Guide or Signs or anything else. But what does that mean? How do we do that? How do we pursue this together? The elders last fall began to discuss this more intentionally. We took a retreat and we're like, how would we define what a disciple is? How do we have that then? In the months that followed into this new year, each and every week as we met, we were talking about how do we begin to transform the culture of a, a church family to be a disciple-making culture. Then as a goal of that, out of that, this summer, we've had five different weeks that we've met with key leaders in the church to talk through what does this mean? How do we live this out? So this series is born out of months of conversations that now we want to continue as a church family. We want this to be something that, that we're talking about, we're thinking about. And, and we're not coming in this series to say, and then we're going to launch this brand new program. That's not it. But we're saying, we want to help define what we're striving for, and let's pursue that together. Let's continue that conversation together as a church family. This isn't going to be, now we're presenting all the answers and we have everything figured out. We don't. And, and, and I think that's going to be a lifelong process and journey as we pursue Christ together. But we want this to be the kind of conversation we're having. And so my prayer is that this series would open up that conversation to the whole of the church body. And to say, how do we keep moving forward in this together? How does this begin to integrate and permeate everything that we do, from Sunday morning to gatherings outside of church, to community groups, to men's or women's ministry, to, to student, to children, to, to all aspects of church life. How does this begin to permeate that? And so this morning, I want to start simply with the definition of a disciple. Looking at Jesus' first call of the first disciples, what is that goal then that we're moving toward? And then in the following weeks, there's three characteristics of a disciple that we want to press in and talk about. So as we get ready to jump in, let's open in prayer together. And then we'll be reading Jesus' call to the first disciples in Matthew chapter 4. Lord, I thank you for the joy that it is to, to be gathered together as a church family, Lord, to sing your praises because you were worthy, because you were slain. Lord, it is by 
your broken body and your shed blood, that we have forgiveness from our sins, that we can stand here today singing your praises. Lord, I, I pray that you would renew our hearts this morning as we look at what it means to follow you. Lord, convict, co correct, encourage us in this journey this morning. Let your word renew us to pursue you with, with a passion and intensity that you deserve because you were worthy. And in Jesus' name, amen. So let's look at Matthew chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 18 through 22. And, and Jesus has kind of been teaching a little bit up to this point. And then it says in verse 18, While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he, Jesus, said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately... They left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called to them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. What I want us to see here in the very beginning is the authority and the power of Jesus. Like, this is something that, that Matthew is wanting us to see, and it, it's repeated twice, both with Peter and Andrew and then James and John, where Jesus speaks and they respond. Jesus isn't walking by the Sea of Galilee, and he's like, hey, guys, when you're done there, I'm going to be talking over here. I have some interesting ideas about the kingdom of he heaven. You should come listen when you have time, right? Well, when you're not busy, let me share with you some thoughts that I have. That's not what he said. He's walking by the Sea of Galilee, and he's like, follow me. They drop it, and they follow him. Th this following of what it's talking about, it's not just, hey, listen to my teachings, o obey what I say. It literally means physically get up and walk with me. He is walking by the Sea of Galilee, and he's like, join me. I'm walking this direction. They could not stay in the boat and follow him. It was in that moment they had to make a decision, and they immediately left what they were doing and followed. They joined him. This is the authority and power of the call of God. This is because he is worthy. He's not just a good teacher. He is the Son of God. And when he says, come, follow me, we leave whatever we were doing, and we follow. But then listen to what he says. He says, and I will make you. He doesn't say, hey, Peter, I could really use you on Team Jesus. I have some big plans. I'll, I'll even build the church around you, man. No. He says, Peter, follow me, and I will make you. Do, do you see that the, the centeredness of God saying, follow me, and I will make you. I will transform you into who I desire you to be. It is not what we bring to the table. It is not because James and Andrew or, or, or John, none of them had something to offer. They responded with obedience. God said, follow, and they followed. And God was the one who did the work in them. And in that, that, that unconditional command for them to, to follow, the, the authority of Jesus that we see here, there's also then the response of the disciples. That it, it had to begin with one of repentance, because we see right before verse 18 and 17, it says, From that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They would have heard this. Jesus' message is one of, of repentance. Turn from your sin and turn to God. When he said, follow me, that there was one of, of repentance of saying, yes, I know that I am insufficient, and yet the holy God is calling me to follow him, and I will follow, not because I have anything to offer, but because of his promise of the work that he will do in us. We see that, that it meant for them to follow, to, to leave nets, boats, income, career, all of that in, in order to follow Jesus, and yet he was worthy. He was greater than the things that they left behind.
But we also are going to see, and, and what we see throughout the Gospels is that it also required faith. Not just the disciples walking with Jesus. Not just going through the motions and saying the things that Jesus said and doing the things that Jesus did. In the same ways that going to church and using Christian language and speaking a certain way or listening to certain things makes you a Christian. Simply following along with the flow is not what transforms, but it is the faith that comes. It is surrendering then to the one whom we follow. I mean, we see this even with Judas, one of the, the disciples who was with Jesus, right? He was called, he followed, he walked, he saw the miracles, and yet he did not surrender his life. Instead, he walked in rebellion. And so even in that, we see that, that what it's going to mean to be a disciple is one that, that isn't just following a set of norms, mimicking the norms, but it is going to be one of a life of repentance, of surrender, of submitting our lives to God. In my heart, in, in my prayer, through this series and beyond, as we look to the future, is that this would be something God is cultivating in our own hearts individually. What does it then look like for me, in my life, in my circumstances, to follow Christ? What does it mean to surrender? But at the same time, we are not called to God in isolation from one another, but we are called together in community. And so there has to be that application. What does that mean for us? What does it mean for us as a church family to surrender to God? What does that mean for us to follow after Christ together? That it can't just be this individual view. There has to be a sense of what that looks like for us together. And so what I want to do is walk you through the definition that the elders have, have worked through, hours of working through and follow-up conversations of the definition of a disciple, and talk about these components, because I think that these talk about some of the aspects of what it means to be a disciple. I want you to hear our convictions in the hopes that it creates a, a goal for us to move after together. Like disciple, if you've grown up in church, you're like, oh yeah, disciples. But if we all had to sit down and say, well, what is a disciple? Define it. We might come up with all different definitions, right? Like my hope is that through sharing this, it becomes something that's also transferable, that gives us a common language so that as we follow Christ together, we're, we're talking about similar things. We're, we're, we have similar goals that we're moving toward. We have an understanding of how these relate to one another together. And so that definition is this. Hopefully it's up on the screen as well. That a disciple is someone who worships God through ongoing surrender with obedience to God in everyday life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you tracking with that? So you're like, okay, that's good. What's the big deal? It's a definition. What I want to do is, is walk through this slowly, the order, the wording, why we've structured this the way that it is of a disciple is someone who worships God through ongoing surrender with obedience to God in everyday life by the power of the Holy Spirit. So because I am who I am, I see in pictures. So I had to try to draw this out. This, and then out of this definition, in these coming weeks, we're going to look at the three characteristics of a disciple and how that even fits into the values of the church. I've drawn shapes and images all over whiteboard, scrap pieces of paper, and that. If this is helpful for you, great. This is how I remember Chris is shaking his head no. If you're like, just give me the words and stop with the drawings, that's fine. Forget all of that. Just remember the words. I need pictures because I'm still like a kid with a picture book. Okay, so these diagrams, they help me to remember the things. And so I want to start at the beginning. A disciple is someone who worships God. You should see up on the screen that there's like this arrow pointing upward. 
the definition begins with God because discipleship is ultimately about his glory. It's not about us. It's not about you. It's not about you just becoming the best version of yourself. It's not about you just becoming a better person. Discipleship is about the glory of God. God is central, not man. Therefore, the definition of a disciple must begin with God. It is a worship of who God is, not just making man better. And and I believe that, that this is critically important. Because it's not just about becoming a better person. It's not about leadership development. It's not about gaining a position in the church. It's not about growing a bigger church. It's not about planting new churches. The purpose of discipleship is about the glory of God. These other things may be good and secondary, but they are not the primary purpose. We are created in the image of God to reflect his glory. By sin, we have fallen short of that. It is by the blood of Jesus Christ, as he calls us to himself, that our lives are redeemed and now able to reflect his glory. And discipleship is the aspect of growing in our worship of who he is. This is why we should long to be growing. To be growing individually, to be growing together as a community, because it is for and ultimately about the glory of God. This should drive us. It should motivate us. One of my favorite passages is in Colossians chapter 1. And when it says that, you'll see, the, you'll see it up on the screen. But to kind of paraphrase, it says, Jesus created everything in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. It says it was through Jesus and that, it, that Jesus was before all things. It is for Jesus that he created everything. In Jesus, all things hold together. And that through Jesus, he has reconciled all things to himself. What I want you to see in this is the complete saturation of Christ being first in the greatest priority. He's the one who created everything. It is for him and to him and through him. This is why the definition begins with someone who worships God. God is at the pinnacle. Discipleship is ultimately about him, the work that he is doing. Now how? How do we begin to experience and how do we go about worshiping God this is where then it moves so you'll see an arrow then pointing down underneath it's through ongoing surrender this is is how God is glorified that he is other he is holy this is why it begins with repentance as we follow that, that we surrender our life. It means we yield, we submit, we crumble, we relinquish, we forfeit, we concede at the foot of Christ. We bend our knee and bow our head because he is worthy. And so we surrender our lives to him, all of it. And that this is ongoing. It, it, it means that, that throughout life, we, we are pursuing, it's not just a one-time thing of surrender. Like when I was a kid, I grew up in church, so I learned to say the church things, to do the church things, right? And, and I surrendered to Jesus so I wouldn't have to go to hell. He didn't need my life. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. I just didn't want to go to hell. So let me trust Jesus so I can get out of hell. And then God, how about you just bless whatever I want to do? That's not the surrender of a disciple that we're talking about. We're saying, yes, God met me there. And to saying, yes, I can be saved, but then I continue to surrender. That means my ambitions, my desires are all surrendered to the supremacy of Christ in life. And we say that that this is ongoing, and, and we wrestled with this word. That we chose not to use the word increasing. Like, th- this is when it's, we start to think about it, because you think of increasing, like, oh, today I'm surrendering, and, and that's growing more and more and more. But in reality, if we're honest with one another, haven't you experienced seasons in your spiritual life? Some seasons when you're like, man, I'm growing, and I'm hungering, and I'm thirsting for God's word, and I can't get enough, and I want to learn more, and, and God's just changing our character, and that's beautiful and good. 
And then we have other seasons that are like dark nights of the soul. It feels like winter. The leaves have fallen off. There's no fruit on the trees. And it's like, God, what's happening here? And yet it's often in those seasons, though others may not see it, that our roots are sinking deeper and deeper into the truth and knowledge of who God is. And spring's coming, but it's not yet. And so I think that there needs to be an understanding and grace with one another that, yes, we want to pursue surrender to God. In the the span of life, we see these seasons at play and that it is ongoing. We work out and live out our salvation, that it's not just a one-time thing, but I pray for all of us. We're continuing to ask God, What aspect of my character are you continuing to to correct and transform? What what kind of person are you calling me to be that I'm not yet today for for your glory? Help me to surrender that. These things that, that I'm trying to control, that I'm trying to manage myself, help me to lay those down. And this is what we mean then by ongoing surrender. And then that will lead to with obedience to God. I want us to be careful here because obedience to God is not parallel or equal to surrender. It is submitted to, obedience is submitted to surrender. Meaning this, obedience that is separated from surrender is a godless morality that does not glorify God. Let me say that again. Obedience that is separated from a surrender to God is a godless morality that does not ultimately worship God. Here's what I mean, that that if you're just out here trying to do the right thing, to let me just be a better person, but you are doing that on your own without repenting and surrendering to God, you're just trying to be a good person This is not to the glory of God. This is to your own glory. And that is not what discipleship is about. And that is not what it means to be a follower of Christ. That surrender to God, as we submit ourselves to Him, that leads to, that produces obedience to God. Which is important. We don't discount obedience. I think about what Jesus says in in John 14, verse 15, that if you love me, you'll obey my commands. And some will say, see, obedience. And it's like, yes, but if you love me, you will obey my commands. Love, surrender, precedes our ability to truly obey. And so we need to make sure that, that even the prepositions in this definition are important. That someone who worships God through surrender with obedience to God. Because surrender is what produces the obedience. And and this is what it even says in the Great Commission. as, As we make disciples, that final part. Yes, as you're going. Yes, in baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then teaching them to obey. That's needed and it's right. But we must keep that order clear. But I love this sense of like in obedience to God, then you'll see these lines coming down both sides of the definition. This is why even when I'm saying it, I'm literally thinking visually. Worship God, surrender, obedience to God in everyday life. This is is one of the reasons why we say discipleship isn't just a program of the church. It needs to be our culture. It's not just something that happens at one point, but it is ongoing because as we're growing as believers, I don't know if you've experienced this depending on where you may be at in your your spiritual journey, but when I was newer in the faith, it was like, okay, don't do this bad thing. (laughs) Do this good thing. It can feel like that, like have a heart that surrendered to God. It's like, okay, I, I want to surrender. And then God begins to say, what about your thought life? 
What about your motive for even why you did this good thing? Was this for, for my glory or for your own? And it's just like, oh, it keeps getting deeper and deeper how much you realize God transforming beyond just what is on the exterior for others to see or that can be easily seen or diagnosed. God is, is sifting my heart, my intentions, my motives, and you realize that this transformation is not done and that what he's transforming needs to impact every aspect of my life. That discipleship is not just about this spiritual compartment of your life, of this is me following Jesus, and then, then I have this other side, and then I'm a father, and I'm a, a brother, and a son, and, and I have this job, and I'm doing this. Like True discipleship sees Christ at the center. And then all of life is transformed. It, it needs to transform the way I, I relate to my wife, the way I, I relate to my kids. It, it needs to impact work and ethics. It needs to impact the movies I watch. It needs to impact the TV shows I watch. It needs to impact the books I read, the places I go. It needs to impact how I eat and, and drink. It needs to impact how I see myself and how I see you. It needs to impact every aspect of our lives. And this is why it's a lifelong journey. This is why it could never be a program that we say, go through classes one, two, and three, and then graduate and teach others. That would be foolishness. Because transformation is not just about information. It is not just about the more you know, then the holier you are. Right? Like, how many pastors, seminary professors, seminary students, Christians, have we seen who know, have forgotten more about the Bible than I may ever know, and yet have walked in disobedience. Information does not equate to transformation. But transformation is when we surrender all of life to God, when we walk humbly with Him and with each other. To, to experience God transforming us when he says, and I will make you. And all of this is by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to be careful here because if we're not, we just tag that on at the end, right? Oh, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, done. But we focus on all these other things that we're supposed to do. But what I want us to see here is in the same way that we begin with God, as someone who worships God, we also end with God. He is the beginning and the end by the power of the Holy Spirit. That it is only by the power of the Spirit that we can truly worship God. It is by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can experience ongoing surrender. It is only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can live in obedience to God. It's the, only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can see this happen in every aspect of our lives. Think about what Paul said to the church in Galatia. Paul said, do not be foolish. You began with the Spirit. Let's equate that to repentance, but now you're going to be perfected. You're going to be transformed by your own efforts. No, for through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Here's what often happens. Trust in Jesus. It is by grace, through faith, in Christ, and now do these spiritual disciplines and you'll become holy. Right? Maybe I'm the only one, but I kind of grew up with an understanding that discipleship was like this. Trust in Jesus by faith and then do these things and you'll grow. And Paul's saying, don't be foolish. You began with repentance, he says. But now you think you're going to be perfected? You think that you're going to be transformed by the things that you do? No. He says, for through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. It is only by the power of the Holy Spirit. We grow in the same way that we were saved. By faith and in repentance, in submission, to Christ. That is how we will experience growth. As we surrender to him. And then it says like that God is ultimately central for through the spirit. 
That is how we worship Jesus. Like it's from him and to him. And so you see this shape, a hexagon on the screen, and at the center is this circle for the Holy Spirit. And what I want you to see there is as if that's a a nucleus, if you will, to, to the cell. It's the engine, that it is from him, as it says in Colossians 1, that all of these things are possible. It's from him that we worship. It's from him that we surrender. It's from him that we can be obedient to God in everyday life. Like, that is the power, but it is also to him. The worship, the surrender, the obedience is ultimately to his glory. It's for him and from him. And through him. And so as we look at this, and you might be like, hexagon, that's a weird shape, right? I, I was thinking this initially, and I have to say, like, part of my thinking of, of why I, I've grown to like this, and, and this is my own, I'm a nerd, okay? So just going to own it. If you want to lose a lot of time, this afternoon or this week, look up on Google or YouTube, hexagon in nature. Like, there's a sense of this is a very natural form, and I like this because, uh, are the pictures up there? Like, you'll see up on the top left is is a dragonfly. There's 30,000 hexagons that form the eye uh, of a dragonfly. You'll, you'll see this in, in how snowflakes are formed. The natural shape from salt rocks as they begin to break up our, our hexagons. It's bubbles next to each other will turn from a circle into hexagons. And, and there's a whole mathematical and scientific reason for why this happens that I'm not going to bore you with. But if you want to lose time and you want to like geek out a little bit, seriously, just look this up. The angles and all of it. But I like that it is a very natural form. Because discipleship is often talked about in very natural growth terms in Scripture. We see in John 15, what we're going to be looking at next week, actually. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. He's using this sense of growth. Or you look at at Psalms 1, verse 3, a tree planted by streams of water will bear much fruit. Like there's a sense of this planting and growth and in natural terms that we would see in nature. And and believe it or not, this is one of those shapes. But what I like about it particularly is it's not just about the shape on its own. See, like in, in bubbles, when you put them together and when they did this experiment and it begins to form and as it comes together is when these 120 degree angles start to form that makes the structure perfect according to some engineers the the greatest shape in nature is what others have have called it because of how it relates to one another and I think that this is an important thing for us to remember as we talk about discipleship that it's not just about our individual journey but it's also in how we're connected to one another that I do want something that helps us begin to communicate what discipleship is and how we're pursuing that as a church and as we continue to even build on this outline in the coming weeks. But it's also in how we relate to each other, how there's strength in the community, that God has not just called you to himself, he has called you into the family. He has called us sons and daughters. And sometimes I have this image in my mind that that within our culture, it's popular to say, it's just me and Jesus. I don't need the institution of the church. The church is the family of God. It is a family. And sometimes we treat it as if we're adopted into this new family, but we're just going to stay in the room. It's kind of messy out there. It's noisy. There's lots of people. I'm just going to hide out in my room. This is just about me and Jesus. But no, he is inviting us into a community as we follow after Jesus together. That as we talk about discipleship, what that means, I don't want it to just have such a me focus. I want it to have a God centrality and a community application as we pursue this together. 
And then what does this mean? How does this shape? And that, that's why I like this shape. This is why if you actually look at some of these new signs on the way in, you're going to see this subtly in the background of things. Because I want it to be, for those who are visual, to say, oh, I know what that means. I understand. I want it to bring back to your memory that, yes, this is about worshiping God. Yes, this is about surrender. This is about obedience in everyday life. And this is only possible by the grace and mercy of God. And so I want to close with, with these two questions as we continue forward in this series in the coming three weeks, as, as we're going to look at the characteristics of a disciple, of abiding in Jesus, growing in Jesus, and being fruitful in Jesus, is going to be what we're talking about each of those in the coming three weeks. But I want to ask you this first question, that are you following Jesus? Like, to think about this for a moment. I don't want just like a yes or no. Yep, Christian, good, next. But what does that mean? Like, what areas of your life, do, do you find yourself like, man, I'm surrendered to God in these areas, but I'm having a really hard time surrendering this other area. I'm having a hard time surrendering my family, what, what's happening at work. Um, my thought life. I'm having a hard time surrendering these other aspects. Where are you struggling also to follow Jesus? W what is that looking like? And then I don't want it to just be now go try harder, right? That's exactly what we said is not. But what I would encourage you is as God brings these things to your mind, not in condemnation, of how you're just not enough or, or that, that is not from the Holy Spirit, but he will lead us into conviction. And that is where we begin to work through the process of repentance, acknowledging that we have fallen short. And in surrender, we ask the Holy Spirit for help in this area because God is glorified in our asking for help because it shows that he is the provider Sometimes we think that we've fallen short, and now I have to try harder for God to be glorified. But what I want us to see is that, no, when we see, when God brings conviction and we say, I've fallen short in this area, by our surrender in asking God for help, we are showing that he is the one who is able to provide us the help that we need for the change that he is leading us to. And so even in our need, in our repentance, we bend our knee and bow our head before God and say, Lord, I know that I've fallen short and I desperately need your help. I cannot do it on my own. Would you help me relinquish control in this area? W would you help me to relinquish the ruminating worries and anxieties that I have in this other area? Help me. So are you following Jesus and where are you struggling to follow him. And then this final question, are you following Jesus with others? Not just alone, not just on your own that you leave here and have these private conversations just between you and God, but in the same way that we have repentance, we confess our sins before God, we also, it says, confess our sins one to another. That we follow Jesus not just individually, but also together in community. And so, with whom are you following Jesus? Who is beside you in this journey? Not just for your own good, but also for theirs. There is strength through the connection. When you look throughout Scripture and how it talks about the body of Christ, being an encouragement and a support to one another, we are not meant to live in isolation from one another, but together in community. And you will both be an encouragement to them as they will be to you. And so if you find yourself isolated from others, let us help you get connected. One way we do that, yes, is in community groups. You'll be hearing more about that in coming weeks. But I also want to make sure that it's clear we are a community. Us here today in this moment, we are a community. This is an opportunity to be connected, to make deep, meaningful relationships with one another, 
that we can follow Christ together. So if you will, will you stand with me? As we close in prayer, and as we think about this in the coming weeks, I, I do pray that you would be thinking and praying about what this means for you personally, what this means for us together as a church as we pursue Christ together. Not with all the answers, not with some fancy, beautiful program, but with a heartfelt surrender before God. Let's pursue Him with everything we have. Let us abandon whatever might be holding us back and let us immediately follow Him. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you that you call us to yourself even though we are completely undeserving. Lord, that you have chosen to call us sons and daughters, to call us into a family when we were orphans. God, when we were enemies, you drew near. Sacrificing yourself, the perfect Lamb of God, Jesus. Lord, that you died. You gave your life. You poured out your blood for the forgiveness of our sins so that we might be reconciled to you and to one another. Lord, all of this, everything we see here this morning is because of you. It's because of your work. God, let us sing. Let let your life breathe into us anew, afresh, the beauty of who you are and all that you have done and the joyful journey that you have called us into to follow you. Lord, to reflect your glory to the world and to one another. And in Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue in worship together.